Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Level Up Content Cadence Workshop. In this talk, I'll cover what Content Cadence is and why it is so important as a part of supporting your live game. Then we'll dive into the specifics of designing and producing Content Cadence releases. So what is Content Cadence? It is part of Live Ops or Live Operations, which is just the blanket term for all of your post-launch release types. And that includes major updates, which introduce new features and change the gameplay of your game. So for example, adding a PVP feature where there was not one before. Then there are bug fixes, which address issues and unintended behavior in the game. Quality of life updates, which improve the player's experience, often through UI and user experience updates. And live events, which energize your audience with limited time content and experiences. And finally, there's content content cadence, which is the regular drip of new content, like the new pets in Adopt Me or new furniture in Welcome to Bloxburg, which are added to the game every few weeks. But producing that much content regularly and putting out releases so frequently can put a lot of pressure on a team. So is it really worth all that effort? The answer is yes, for a lot of reasons. So regular releases establish a routine for you and your players. They increase opportunities for monetization, and they fill in the gaps between your larger releases with content that is relatively quick and inexpensive to produce. Because content cadence releases are so frequent, it's important to keep them lightweight for your own team's sanity and to protect their time while working on more significant releases. So with that in mind, content cadence releases should leverage existing tech and systems only. If you don't have systems that support uh, content cadence already in your game, and we'll talk about what those kinds of systems can be, um, then you should probably do a major update to introduce a system like that before you dive into content cadence. So the goal here is to make use of the tools that already exist in your game. So to say that another way, content cadence should not introduce new features, currencies, or one-off mechanics. Save those big undertakings for your game expansions. Content Cadence is all about little bite-sized releases that are easy for your team to produce. So the important thing that Cadence does provide for your players is new content to consume while they wait for you to put out your next big update. And players are always going to be hungry for more to do in your game. So you can think of major expansions as big filling meals and content cadence as the snacks in between that help keep them going. So I've mentioned a few examples, but let's take a look at some of the content types that are appropriate for cadence releases. Like customization items, including outfits and accessories for avatars and furniture or decorations for homes. You can also produce fairly easily a new car or a pet Assuming you already have cars or pets in your game, then you're just building on existing content. Same caveat goes for playable content. Assuming that you are not creating new systems for these things, then you can regularly release playable maps like the courses in Epic Golf, first person shooter maps in Arsenal, or stadiums in Super Striker League. You can also add quests that draw on objectives from actions that players can already perform in your game. All of those types of content are relatively quick to produce, depending on your team, uh, once the supporting systems already exist in your game. And that's important because you'll want to release them regularly in order to establish a routine. A routine is a, is a good thing for both you and for your players. It tells players that this game is alive and will continue to grow. So it's worth their investment in both playtime and maybe money. And they'll be sure to want to keep coming back so they don't miss out on anything. FOMO is real. A routine is also good for your team because it helps to define a schedule and manage the scope, the size of your releases. So with that in mind, how often should you release new content? Well, it really depends on your team's size and capabilities, but it's a good rule of thumb to release at least once a month in order to maintain your player's attention. 
course, it's even better to release more often, maybe weekly or biweekly, if your team can manage it. That might sound daunting. It can be challenging to come up with new content that frequently. So one trick that can help you with that is to theme each release. Now let's talk briefly about theming. Themes can help you in brainstorming. Your brain already has connections to common themes that you can draw on for ideas. So for example, if I say summertime, your head is probably immediately filled with images of sunshine and swing pools and beach balls. And those images can drive your choices for items for a summer themed release. And it might seem counterintuitive, but actually creating a box that your ideas must fit into can make it easier to generate them than if you have no restrictions at all. They can also make sure that your ideas are released at the best time. So if you know ahead of time that you'll have a winter themed release in December, then you probably won't release a snowmobile in July. Right? You'll save that great idea for when it has the most impact on your players and your game. So another great thing to think about theming uh, is that it makes it really easy for players to understand what's in your release. So your team has an easier job in creating marketing messages that build up hype around it and explain to players, this is what's coming. Themes also ensure that each release is unique. So maybe they generally have the same kinds of items from release to release, but those items feel different from each other because the themes are different. Maybe aesthetically they look different, so they seem like new items. When choosing a theme, you want to be as mass appeal as possible. But of course, recognizing you can't please everyone all the time. Some players might not love the theme that you choose for this month's release, but they know that another release is on its way soon because you've established a routine, and it's a good chance that they'll be more excited about that next one. So let's talk about coming up with themes, starting with holidays, which are a goldmine of content ideas. So these can really save you when you're struggling to come up with ideas. And especially as your game goes on longer, it can get harder and harder to come up with ideas for content to produce. However, you should be careful about which holidays you choose. Again, you want to be you know, mass appealing if you as many players as possible. So this is a list of seasons and holidays that are popular sources of themes in games. Not all of them are totally universal, but they can still produce really unique content that players will get excited about. And some of them are easy to generify to put some space between the content and the actual holiday itself. So those examples are in parentheses. So for example, the 4th of July, only celebrated in the US, of course, uh, but you can still draw on that holiday for inspiration and stick to elements that are more universal, like just a celebration of summer with barbecue and fireworks, you know, those elements that we associate with 4th of July but you know, are more applicable to everyone. Another option is to just invent your own holidays or events that are part of your game's unique lore. And that gives you total freedom to come up with whatever holidays are celebrated in your world. So for example, if you have a farming game, you can create an annual harvest festival for whatever crop is really popular in your game. If you have a fantasy game, maybe there's an annual dragon hatching season or a prominent character that your fans really love, you could celebrate their birthday. And you know, even if you have a game that you know is just a fictional town, uh, you can provide some history for that town with a Founders Day. So events like these make your real world feel more real and alive, and help connect your players to the story of that world. So I, I know that it's easy for me to say create a bunch of content and release it every week, and it's much harder to actually do it. So I'd like to talk next about some strategies to make that content cadence easier to support. First, uh, put a time box on development and stick to it. And that will force you to scope, to size your releases appropriately. So they're not too big to handle over and over again. And it ensures that you're still spending time on your larger releases. Next, make sure that your cadence releases are primarily art-based. 
You'll add new systems in your major releases. There's a place for that. Cadence is all about the art. And it should be simple, relatively easy to produce art. Mostly things that you already have in the game and can reskin or retheme and adapt to create something that at least feels new. Art generally is also the easiest part of a project to outsource, which of course is not to say that creating art is easy. It requires a lot of talent and skill, but it probably doesn't require quite as much you know, back and forth collaboration between multiple team members, because once an artist has been onboarded with your game's asset requirements and art style, they can probably take it and run with it and create something really awesome. And it also helps that Roblox makes it easy to pay contractors within your games group. Another option is to source your Cadence content from the community by recruiting talented fans of your game. Well, this is one of the many reasons it pays to have a strong social media presence so you can establish that relationship with your players. One way to get fans involved in asset production is through a contest. You outline the requirements, you post them in your social media, and then players share their work with the community. Then you select the winners. Maybe you involve the community in selecting winners as well. So this is a great way as well to find out what kind of content your most highly engaged players get excited about. And it doesn't matter if they're creating it or just responding to the entries. Of course, you do wanna make sure that you're properly recognizing the creators in your community whether that's just recognition online or in the game itself or through a paid contract. You really don't want to make anyone feel taken advantage of. I mean, ideally, this should be a celebration of both your players and your game. So that relationship runs both ways. And when your players feel like they are part of the game, it develops goodwill within your community and keeps those players engaged. And as a bonus, it takes some of the pressure off your team to constantly put out new content. You know, maybe they can take a break or for focus that extra time on some of the other releases, right? So that is one of our stopping points if you have any questions. All right, we do have some questions for you, Aaron. Uh, the first one is, how do you keep content cadence updates from getting repetitive for players? Sure, so we're gonna talk a little bit about that later, but it's really important to strike a balance between you know, content that is really familiar to you and to your players that you can produce very quickly and some that has some novelty to it. And it also helps if you keep up with your major updates, your, your big game expansions, because those should be introducing new systems that will provide new opportunities to create content assets. Awesome, all right. Our next one is, is it better to create content cadence that is permanent in the game or is it better to have uh, ones that are limited time? Ooh, that is an excellent question. Um, I think the answer is really a mixture of both. You do want to make sure that your players never run out of content, even if they come in later, that they have this you know, long tail of content to consume. But those limited time releases also are really energizing for your players. Um, it really gets them engaged to complete whatever you know the quest is associated with it, et cetera to try to get those items before they go away, um, which is also probably a good part of your monetization strategy that you're working on. So uh, I really recommend having a mixture of both. All right, and the next question, is there a cutoff point for a certain content? Like if I have a car system, is there a point where I have too many cars? Ooh, um, yeah, that's totally possible. And that's why you know, it's important to have more systems in your game than just the one that you're leaning on for content cadence. And that's something that, you know, you're probably going to hear from your players in social media that they're maybe not as excited about this car, or you can check your metrics and see, all right, these cars are not performing as well as cars in the past. And so that's a good time to consider pivoting to some other kind of content. Okay. And the next one, uh, how can we keep making content cadence if we are in school or if we don't have enough time to create content cadence? Got it. So it's really tricky, and especially, you know, you're a small team, maybe a, a solo dev and you have other responsibilities. Um, I think that's where you're leaning on your community really comes in handy. They can take some of that pressure off from having to do it all yourself. So if you can build up that player base and that, you know, relationship with your players online, you know, that's a really good way for you to find you know, fans who are excited about producing content for you and, you know, reach out to them and, and see how it works. Try it out. And, you know, that might really save you some time. All right. 
Our next question comes from 89.5. Uh, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, thank you, Dan. Aaron, I wanted to ask, how can we keep adding new content to our game while still making sure it's accessible and not overwhelming for new players? Yeah, so that's a great question too. So, you know, you can do some things just in your UI that help make it easier to you know, navigate, um, have a search field or something like that that makes it easier to find that content. But you can also, you know, block a lot of your content behind progress in your game so that players aren't overwhelmed with it, you know, on their first day, that they slowly unlock new content as they make progress level up throughout your game. Um, that just opens up more and more content to them. And that also just as a matter of progression, like gives them things to look forward to. So they see other players with these items that they don't have, and then they get excited because they know that if they keep working in your game, they'll be able to get those as well. I see, thank you. All right, thank you, 89.5. Uh, our last question for this section, but we will have other sections where you can ask questions again, but Thunder1222, two, 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 please unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, hi, Thunder. Hi, okay, so the my question is, um, is it better to make content's cadence, you know, short term or long term in terms of, you know, the content you're putting out? Short term or long term, meaning it might go away after a time or stick around forever. Is that what you mean? Um, more like uh, how long it takes the user to complete whatever the content you added is. Got it. Um, you know, that really depends in part on how much content you already have in your game. Um, and how valuable that content is to players and you know, how much effort you can expect them to put into it in order to get it. Um, it's really a decision that you have to weigh based on your own individual game. Uh, if you already have a ton of content, then you know maybe you do push it off, require more effort to get to it, because um, players are, in theory, you know, consuming all of that prior content before they get to it. Um, so that's really a game by game decision, but you know, those are the factors that you have to think about when you're making that decision. Got it, thank you. All right, I believe those are all the questions for now. Please uh, take it away, Aaron. All right, now let's dive into some details for actually designing content cadence releases, starting with the topic of packages. So by package, I just mean a handful of assets that are linked thematically and released together. So you wanna keep your package size small so that you don't spend too much time on any release and you don't inundate the player and create choice paralysis. So keep it small and keep it focused. And keep it focused on items that players want. Obviously, you want players to be excited about the content that you're taking time to produce. So the longer your game goes on, the more social media presence you have, the more analytics you have access to, the more you can gauge like, what content is really popular in your game. Ideally, uh, these should also be items that players will want to own multiples of. So you don't have a situation where you know, players get one item that they need, and then they aren't interested in any of your future releases. So cars are a great example. You know, players probably only really need one car to get around in your game, but aesthetics are also a factor and so is prestige. So there's a good chance that a cool new sports car will still appeal to players who already have a car. You also want to choose content that supports your core loop. So let's review briefly the concept of core loops just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Core loops are the essential repeated actions that players perform in your game in order to make progress. You wanna draw from these actions in order to identify good opportunities for content cadence assets. So taking a look at this core loop for standard RPG, we can assume that the game probably has some or most of these systems. And that's a good starting point for identifying assets that players will want or need from your content cadence. And again, to reiterate, content cadence assets should be quick and inexpensive for your team to produce on a consistent schedule. So let's talk a little bit more about what it means to be inexpensive in this context. So tech requests are expensive. Your coders should largely be focused on major updates and improving the experience of the game. So content cadence really shouldn't ask too much of them because you don't want to sacrifice time and delay those bigger releases. So keep your tech requests small and reasonable. If you're adding a new set of quests to a game that already has quests, 
there might be some light programming work needed in order to support tracking actions in the game that maybe other quests haven't had to track before. Or maybe you want to make a small change to your UI in order to better surface new items in your store. Those kinds of tech requests are probably manageable and appropriate for content cadence, but you do want to make sure that you're you know, looped in with your engineers, make sure that you know, those are actually are reasonable requests for your team size. And be sure to lean on your team's strengths as well. Maybe your animator is just learning. So it's easier if the majority of your content cadence releases are primarily static objects like furniture until they're ready to commit to releasing, you know, maybe a pet every two weeks as well. well. Things like furniture and avatar items can have a ton of variety in colors and patterns and shapes while still being pretty similar in terms of production. So they are ideal candidates for this kind of release. But really, anything that you can reuse may be a good option in your game. As content designers, it is our responsibility to understand what content in our game is easy to recycle so that our requests don't overburden our artists. Well, one way to reuse content is to simply recolor an asset like these two dogs from Adopt Me. They're both adorable. They're both visually unique enough that players will be excited to have both of them. You can also reuse animation rigs across models that are similarly, similarly shaped and sized. So you don't have to create a custom rig every time. And in the case of these dogs, they can probably share animations as well. And you can use minor changes to the geometry of a model in order to give it some new details and a unique silhouette without building a whole new one from scratch, like this piggy skin that added wings and a halo and modified the weapon. And if you have content that is only available during an event or a seasonal sale, there's no reason why you can't bring it back again, because the majority of your players, you know, by the time you do that, probably won't have it yet. But of course, it would be nice to throw in a couple of new things for your players who do. Content that makes for a good cadence release, let's take a look at some sample packages. All right, so remember our fictional generic RPG. Uh, let's assume that this made up game already has these systems built. So what items could be produced to support those systems? Well, quests, that one's easy, just more quests. Uh, that just involves writing, some design work probably for balancing difficulty and rewards, and maybe a new data hook from one of our coders. Combat, well, more things to fight is always great. Um, so more mobs. The scripted encounters tend to veer into the too tech heavy category and so do raids. Like they're cool, but they might require too much engineering time depending on your team size. Exploration, uh, you know, quests, we already have that. And dungeons are on the borderline in terms of too much effort. But customization, that's the jackpot. These are all tech light and art heavy assets. So I think that our best candidates are these, um, but doesn't mean that we have to do all of these every release, but it's good to have options so our cadence packages don't start to feel stale over time. Now let's put together a package starting with the theme. So maybe we've added new regions to our map recently and the older mountainous region to the north isn't getting much traffic these days. Well, this content release is the perfect opportunity to drive players to re-engage with that zone and the content there. So let's focus all the content for this package on that region that I'm going to call the Icefall Mountains. So we said that we wanted a new mob for players to fight. Uh, we've got an existing brown elk mob in the game. So let's take that and recolor it in blues and grays. Maybe give it icicle antlers to really sell the whole ice magic theme of that zone. And we'll of course need some uh, rewards for defeating him. So we already have armor and swords in the game, naturally. So that shouldn't be too tough to produce new ones. And now we just need a way to direct players to that new enemy to let them know that it exists and drive them into that zone. It's the whole point of this release. So let's lean on our quest system. And, you know, we really want to have that stag feel special and not just a reskin. So, you know, maybe let's get a coder to modify his attack to deal frost damage over time so he feels different from the standard stag. 
and throw in some glowy effects on his antlers uh, when his attack is ready. So other than that, um, we just need a couple of new data hooks to support those quests because he's a new mob. We've never had you know, players fight him before. So um, and we need a little help from our coders to make that happen. So we'll talk with our team to make sure that there's nothing unexpectedly time consuming about these requests. But once they sign off on it, that's our package and we're ready to start production. Now, another important consideration always is your game's economy. You wanna keep it in mind uh, when you're putting together your cadence package. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with the infamous money tree from Adopt Me. Uh, it's a tree that produces cash. And when it was first released, players could collect $5 from it every 10 minutes all day long. So that endangered the game's economy because suddenly players had too much money. And the longer that went on, the worse that problem was going to get. So now there's a limit. Players can only collect up to $100 a day. So heed the lesson of the money tree. Avoid items that create a new source of resources and might unbalance things, or at the very least understand the impact it will have when you make that choice and build in limits. Use analytics to determine if any of your resources or currencies are inflated. So if they have you know, too much in their inventories or their wallets, you can release new items that help sink those resources and pull them out of players' inventories and thereby reduce inflation. When players stop buying one item and buy the new one instead, that's called cannibalization. So the new item is cannibalizing sales from the old one and you're not really netting anything in that exchange. But if items are different enough, players are more likely to want both. Speaking of economy, uh, your cadence item should be monetizable. Content is your most valuable resource in your game. You put a lot of effort into creating it. And if players run out, they might get bored and leave. So it's important for you to protect your investment and theirs. Decide what you want your cadence content to do for your game. You can release it for free and your players will love that. Or you can charge soft currency so your players have to play the game in order to earn it. Maybe they'll even be so excited about that content and they'll put some real money into that effort to earn that soft currency in order to make sure that they get it or get it faster. Or of course, you can just charge Robux, uh, which certainly contributes to your monetization goals. But keep in mind that it does exclude your non-paying players. Ideally, your game would have a mix of all three and your content cadence releases can as well. All right, any more questions? All right, Aaron, we have a few more questions for you here. The first one is, how long should you typically work on a content cadence? Is there a length of time that is too long? Yes, so that's a very individual kind of response to your team, like how big is your team? How fast do they work? But Generally, we're gonna get into uh, this a little bit more here in a bit, but generally you don't want to spend more than two or three weeks probably on your, your cadence content um, because at that point, you, know, you start to get into the point where your, your time is better spent on your larger, like more impactful releases. Okay, and our next question, should you try and make content that players should be able to get within the time frame? or should you make it so it's really hard to collect everything? What are your recommendations on balancing? Ooh, so that really comes down to your philosophy and strategy for your individual game. Um, it's certainly valid to do either one. Um, one thing to kind of keep in mind is that if, if it is too hard, then some of your players are going to give up and maybe give up on your game as well. If they feel like they can't keep up or if the amount of effort that they're putting in, you know, isn't equal to the rewards that they're getting. So you really have to kind of balance that for yourselves and for your particular audience. All right, I got a great follow-up question here, which is how can you tell if you fatigued your players with too much content? So uh, the answer is ideally you have analytics set up so that you can track your players' behavior, you know, how they're engaging with your content. If they're buying those items, for example, if they're completing your quests, you know, if that starts to drop off, then, you know, it could be just indicative that they're not excited about that particular content. But if you see that as a trend over time over multiple releases, then it probably is indicating that 
you know, maybe you need to pull back a little bit or change things up, introduce something new. And that's a really good opportunity for you to you know, identify something, a new system for your game that you can release in a major update that will reinvigorate your opportunities for content cadence. All right. I think that's all the questions we have for now. Great. All right. So we have an idea of how to create a content cadence package from a design perspective. Let's pivot now to production with some strategies that will hopefully make that content treadmill a little easier for you. All right, let's start with an asset pipeline. So a pipeline just describes how an asset moves through each stage of production from one set of hands to the next until it's ready to be released. It should clearly delineate who on your team is responsible for the asset at each stage and when and how that asset is handed from one person to the next. Does there need to be a meeting? How about documentation? How does someone know that it's their turn to pick up that ball and run with it? And what information do they need in order to do that successfully? Now, it's true that things like this that I'm gonna talk about in this section are probably most applicable to larger teams, but I would also be willing to bet that you know, many of your smaller teams are distributed from your team members. You're not working in the same space and probably a lot of you are outsourcing your assets as well. And that means that communication is still so important and streamlining that process, being efficient is really the name of the game. So when you are defining your pipeline, uh, there are some stages uh, that you might find relevant for your team from the initial design phase to concept and production. Maybe there are some approval stages thrown in uh, just to ensure that the asset meets requirements before it's implemented. So the first stage, design, uh, we talked about pretty thoroughly already. This is where you brainstorm and select ideas for your content package. Then you should be prepared to present those ideas to the rest of the team, get their feedback and iterate. You know, there's a great chance that they have some you know, really good ideas to plus up the ones that you came with. So use their brains as well to help make the release as great as it can be. Once everyone agrees on that direction, it moves into the concept phase where an artist translates those ideas into images. Then the artist and the feature owner agree on the visual direction based on those concepts. So this might seem like an unnecessary step, but for example, in our RPG package, uh, the armor pieces that we designed are meant to be rewards that we're asking players to put a lot of effort into earning. So it's important that not only they match the theme of the release and the story of the quests, but they're particularly cool looking assets that serve as a desirable reward. That means that there are some acceptance criteria that have to be met before these concepts are approved. But hopefully the kickoff meeting that we just did did its job and everyone is on the same page. So approval is quick and easy. But of course it's possible that some iteration may be needed. And that's especially true if you are outsourcing the work and the artist isn't as integrated with your team and familiar with how you do things and the needs of your game. Once a concept is approved, they move into production, which could require more or fewer steps depending on the asset and could require multiple team members. So for example, if your modeler and your animator aren't the same person, then there's gotta be some kind of handoff and communication between them. So admittedly, I'm glossing over these details because this is a generic pipeline example, but you'll want to fully define what that process is for your team so there's no confusion so no assets fall through the cracks because someone forgot to do something or didn't even know that they were responsible for it. Uh, next, the assets go through a final round of approvals. Again, just to make sure that they meet design requirements and especially useful if you are outsourcing. And if they don't meet your approval, then more iteration might be needed until it's right. Now the assets are ready for final implementation steps. So, that might mean hooking them up to the store or might be a necessary task for a writer to add you know, text, final names and flavor text to those items. Finally, the assets are tested to verify functionality. Since they aren't too complex, hopefully this won't take too long and no iteration is required. So as you're creating your pipeline, ask yourself who is responsible at each stage and what is the process for moving from one stage to the next and handing off that asset to a new person? You know, do you send an email? Do you have to update a task on a tracking app? So make sure that your team understands this process because that will ensure that communication is smooth and assets are completed on time 
and two specifications. So you can stick to your, your scheduled routine of releases. All right, next, it is a really good idea to create a roadmap. So roadmaps define your team's schedule of upcoming releases. They help you to effectively decide who's working on what and when, as well as how large a release should be. And they help you to take into consideration the releases that surround it, which is important for maintaining variety of content from release to release. So when you're setting up your roadmap, make sure that your cadence schedule is sustainable. You don't want to sacrifice development time on other releases like major updates or live events because they serve their own important purposes in your live ops strategy. And you also don't want to burn out your team from overwork. But, you know, players can also get burnt out. So if you throw too much at them too fast or require too much effort for the reward, or even just release the same kind of content over and over, they're going to start feeling possibly unable or uninterested in keeping up. So take care with balancing all of your releases in context with each other and not just thinking of them as standalone content. Now, I highly recommend that you plan three months out at a minimum. So you can do things like choose your themes in advance and determine the best time for your team members to take some time off because knowing where you're going helps you get there more efficiently. One way to do that is for your team to think of work in each release in terms of sprints. Sprints are just blocks of time dedicated to the development of a specific feature or release. They're usually between one and four weeks in length and include time for iteration, testing, and polish. You put a time box around the work that can be flexible, but just be careful because you might start slipping into the development time for other releases. So there are built-in expectations and accountability and understanding about the scope of the work. So here's an example of a roadmap for a fictional game. I use a spreadsheet program, but there are also plenty of apps out there that can help you create a roadmap. So this is just a visual representation of our release schedule. I've color-coded the different types of releases, so pink for events, yellow for content cadence, et cetera. And I've given them all unique, silly names. Uh, so it's easy for you to tell them apart in the example. Along the left, you can also see that I've listed all of our team members. Uh, of course, your team might look a little different. And I've also indicated which releases they'll be working on in each sprint. So for example, uh, Designer2 came up with the Cadence package for Into the North release last week and has handed it off to Artist1, who will spend the next two weeks producing the stag and armor assets. And that release doesn't require a lot of programming time, so it's not represented in their schedules. So remember, this is a like week to week snapshot, so it's not granular enough to represent just a couple of hours of work. But you know, that's what maybe a task tracker is for. So once that cadence package is implemented, it goes to QA. So by then, you know, you're ready to release. So around three weeks from now, that cadence package goes live. And by then, the next package is already been designed and is ready to start production. So you can see a pattern start to emerge, a routine that makes the work predictable for your team. And your players will start to recognize and anticipate your release schedule as well. Once you have a good idea of what your releases look like, the kinds of content that you'll be producing regularly, you can start to create templates that standardize the work and facilitate the flow of those assets through your pipeline. So templates are just forms that your team members fill out in order to record important information for sharing with them. The main goal is to facilitate communication and handoffs as assets move along your pipeline. So let's take a look at an asset request template. So this document would be filled out by the feature owner. In this case, for our example game, uh, that would be the game designer who is defining the cadence package. So things that you might consider including on an asset request document are the asset name, which is the player facing name of that asset, just to keep those things straight. The asset type. So this probably refers to a type of asset that's already in the game. So everyone on the team is familiar with it and understands the implied requirements. So for example, if it's a helmet, it must be sized to fit an avatar's head. 
you also want to include who is making the request, the feature owner, so that questions can be directed to them. And then there's the assigned artist who is responsible for producing the asset and the producer who is the one who can track the work. And then there are dates in which that asset is to be produced and details about the request. So this is where the person requesting it would add a description of you know, what they think the asset should look like, any dependencies related to that asset and provide references if there are any, maybe a link to an image online. So ideally this form would be filled out during the kickoff meeting for the release so that everyone involved understands and is signed up for the work. So here's the form filled out for our ice sword. I'm calling it the ice ball blade because that thematically connects it to the ice ball release. And it's just cooler than ice sword. So I've identified it as a sword. So our artist, Dino Smore, will know that its dimensions are going to be similar to that of existing swords in the game. Uh, the work begins today and is due on the 10th for the Into the North Cades release. I'm the feature owner, so Dino Smore should come to me with questions about functionality and approvals. And you know, that just comes down to, again, these items are in service to the design that the designer has come up with. So it's important that you know, they meet those design requirements. Our producer, Dee Spav, will be able to answer questions about the release schedule and coordinate with a programmer for our tech requests. And finally, I've included a description of the asset and notes to remind the artist that it must match the other pieces in the Icefall armor set, uh, which you know, they may or may not be producing themselves. So they might have to coordinate with another artist on the team. So this should be ideally all the information needed to start the work. And documenting it means that there's accountability and it forces the person making the request to think through what they're really asking for and, and decide, you know, is this an appropriate ask? And to present it in a straightforward, standardized way so it's easy for everyone on the team to pick up this document and understand exactly what the request is. You can also use templates to request and produce text strings for all of your releases. So that might look something like this with fields for an asset's user facing name and flavor text description, as well as the asset path from studio so that whoever is writing these strings who might not actually be involved in producing the asset can ensure that they've matched their strings with the correct item. And here are Cadence assets in that form. So the Icefall stag has a name that appears over his head in the game, just like all of our mobs. And it appears in the quest as well. Um, but he doesn't have a description because he doesn't ever show up in the store or in the player's inventory, which is the only places where we surface those. However, the armor assets do. Uh, so they get a fun little bit of text that describes the item itself and how it was obtained. But of course, that's not all the text for the release. We also have quests to write. So in a quest string template, there are some additional things to think about. What triggers the quest to appear for the player? Uh, this is important information for the coder who will be creating the data hooks for us, maybe helping to implement those quests. So depending on what the quests look like in your game, they may or may not have a name or a description that includes a bit of story. And they may consist of a single task or multiple tasks. So you can adapt the template to suit your needs. Here's what it looks like when our Icefall quests are applied to the template. Uh, the first quest triggers when the event starts, which in this case means when the release goes live, all of the players who are logging into the game will receive that quest. Each quest tells a little bit of a story. So in the first, the player must prepare for their journey into the mountains by obtaining items that will help them along the way. Uh, you'll notice that most of the tasks have the word amount in brackets. Um, that's an embedded variable uh, that can be defined outside of the string so that the string doesn't have to be updated and relocalized if we do decide to rebalance that task later and change that number. So that's it for our quest template. Documenting our strings means that um, you know, they're spell checked, which is always good. Uh, our coders know uh, what hooks are needed to trigger them and to complete the tasks. And when we do QA, we can easily verify that those quests are working as intended. So after we create our templates, we can move on to using them in our design phase. So we won't spend too much time on this because we've already talked a lot about design, but the first step in designing our cadence package is to review the theme that we selected and put on our roadmap. 
as well as the various asset types that are at our disposal that we've previously decided are appropriate for cadence releases. Next, we brainstorm everything that we can think of within that theme and then cull that list of items down until it's of a manageable size. The next step is our kickoff meeting where we iterate and get buy-in from the team and fill out our asset request form, all right? That way we ensure that we're all on the same page, understand what the request really is, all right? Then we write any text that's needed, including promotional text to hype up the release. As the feature owner, we're responsible for the assets, even if we're not the ones creating them. So we have to ensure that they meet our needs. It's important to stay in contact with whoever is producing them, make sure they don't have any questions and to review and approve the work before it's handed off to implementation. Well, the next phase is implementation and testing. It is a good practice to include testing time before every release, no matter what kind it is. Don't just throw stuff in the game and cross your fingers because that way lies heartache, trust me. It's true that content cadence is intentionally simple. There you know, doesn't always need to be a lot of testing time. Not all of your releases are going to include quests that have new functionality or a new mob. Many of them might just be assets, but you should still do testing every time, you know, even if you're just releasing furniture. So you still have to make sure that players can access that content, that it's available in the ways that you want it to be, that you know, it costs exactly what you intended. It's also good to build an iteration time, especially for outsourced assets. You might not need it, but you don't want to delay the release if it turns out that you do. And finally, you can promote and release the content. So anytime you release content in your game, make sure that you promote it to your players. If you're not excited about it, then they might not be. If you build hype early and often, then you can deliver on it and your players will love that. If you're not active on social media, I really think that you're missing out on opportunities to engage with your players. Because when you engage with them, they engage back and you build that mutual relationship that encourages them to stay in your game. You don't have to give away exactly what you're going to release ahead of time. You can just tease it a little. Sometimes the mystery is even more exciting than the full reveal. And images are a great, great way to do that, to tease that reveal that's coming later on. Just show a part of the asset or maybe even just the silhouette. It will get your players guessing in the comments and that back and forth between your players and the players and you, you know, just builds up that excitement even more and keeps them engaged. Right? Then there's release day messages. Let them know that the content is available right now. You want to engage at every stage of the release. So tell your players what's coming, then tell them it's here, and then ask them what they love about it. What do they want to see next? You don't have to take every suggestion and not all of them will be great, but just asking shows that you care about their opinions and they'll appreciate that. So in case you were wondering, the answer is yes, you can templatize social media posts as well. Are you able to do so for a number of reasons? You can track when posts go out, which is especially useful if you are putting up multiple releases where you have multiple games that are putting out releases at the same time and one person writing those posts. Uh, you can also make sure that the right images are matched with that post. And you can stay on top of character limits for various platforms because of course they're all different. And if you're really savvy, maybe you have a list of approved or popular hashtags handy so that your post can reach the largest audience possible. And your artist doesn't, or sorry, your writer doesn't have to keep you know, looking those hashtags up. They're right there in the form for them. And finally, after release is out the door, you can conduct a retrospective. A retrospective, also known as a postmortem, is just a discussion among your team about how the release went. You know, what went right, what went wrong, and what could be done better the next time. Focus on improving your process. In particular with content cadence, the more you do it, the easier it should get because every release is so similar in structure. And the more you refine that process, the quicker it will become easier. And of course, keep it professional. Uh, don't ever make it personal. Everyone is on the same team and you know, hurt feelings tend not to improve performance. So keep it focused on your process. And if you have analytics, this is a really good time to review them 
because metrics like daily active users and payer conversion can tell you how successful your release was, whether players are willing to pay for that content or grind through a series of quests to get it. And then you can compare how well that latest release does to previous ones. And that information can guide the kinds of content that you release, the themes that you choose, and even what days or how often you release new content. If you don't have analytics set up, you are really missing out on some valuable data about your player's behavior. And I encourage you to add some. Okay, we've reached the end. Uh, to wrap things up before we move to QA, here are some closing thoughts. Content cadence is a valuable part of your live ops strategy. Release fresh content regularly to keep your players engaged, playing and paying in your game. Do it on a schedule so that you establish a routine for yourself and for your players and fill in gaps between your larger releases. Cadence releases are called a content treadmill for a good reason. They come up fast and they just keep coming as long as you keep your game alive. And that can be a bit of a grind for your team. So make it as easy as possible for them. Get organized with roadmaps and pipelines and analytics. Work smart by reusing existing content and standardizing common requests with templates. And strike a balance between your various update types, between proven content and novelty, and between work and life. So you can continue to create new content and experiences for this game that you and your players love so much. All right, ready for more questions. All right, Aaron, I have a whole pile of questions for you here. So oh, get ready. <laughs> All right, first question. Would it be a good idea to share a roadmap, not necessarily the one that your team uses, with the community to get their thoughts on what's to come? Yes, and in fact, that's something that AAA studios sometimes do as well, to you know, hype up players, get them excited, and to set expectations about you know, when the next major release is, for example. Um, yeah, so that, that's a perfectly valid thing to do uh, if that's something that you're interested in. Great. All right, next question. For someone who has never created a roadmap, what is the best way to create one? Any system that you would rec recommend to use to start? Sure, so I just use a simple spreadsheet program um, that allows you to you know, put in your dates and to quickly color code the different sprints that you're putting in and to even add in data validation. So you could you know, drop down menu and select the person who's responsible for it. Um, so yeah, you, you can use something like that. You can also just use a calendar, uh, but there are a lot of options out there. Okay, next question. Which could be the best strategy to release the content? Sneak peeks, public tests, announcing the theme or name, and keeping everything else hidden until the release, or just a release with no announcement at all? Got it. Um, I would say that probably the least successful of those is just to drop it without any announcement um, because you're not driving your players back into the game to see it. So it could be days before they know that it's there and doesn't give you that lift, that pop that a new release should give you. So other than that, it really just comes down to, you know, how much you want to share, how much you want to tease your players. Um, I do think that giving a little hint, having some mystery there is a really good way to engage them because it gets them speculating and you know interacting with each other and interacting with you. And that can attract new players to your game as well as they're discussing it online. Great, okay, next question. Should you have time periods when you stop producing content cadence or should you keep producing content cadence on long-term? Um, you know, ideally, this would be something that is ongoing. Uh, it does serve that important purpose of you know, re-engaging your players with fresh content while they're waiting for, you know, some of the bigger changes in your game. But, you know, obviously, especially if you've got a small team, sometimes maybe you need a break and you need to delay it a week um, or two weeks. That's totally normal. That's fine. Content cadence can be a bit of a grind. Uh, it might indicate that, you know, maybe you need some more help on your team. Maybe you can recruit some other developers to help you or even reach out to your community to get their support and you know, filling in some of that content cadence that you're missing. Okay, next question. You said hype new updates on social media early and often, but updates usually don't get finished until just before it goes live. How can we promote new content when the content isn't finished enough to show off yet? 
Sure. Well, um, you know, you can just do it in text. You can do it with the concept art. So there are still ways that you can hint at what's coming. Uh, you know, you could even maybe take an image online. If you're releasing jungle pets, then you could start, you know, dropping in pictures of tigers and things in your posts and that your, your player's thinking, you know, why is this here? And then they start to connect those dots and think, oh, they're kind of teasing that maybe jungle is up next. So there are ways that you can do it, even if your assets aren't totally finished. All right, and our next question for you. Um, is it worthwhile having a backlog or stockpile of unreleased content in the event a cadence release experiences production issues or does not meet deadlines? Absolutely, that is a really excellent idea. Um, you know, smaller teams, it might be harder to generate that backlog, but it never hurts to have a little extra content in your back pocket. Um, if you do that, then I would suggest, you know, picking some themes that can be dropped at any time in the year, um, just having some content that's not holiday themed so that, you know, you can release that whenever you really need it. Great. Um, for a large team, how can you make sure that a new feature won't have any negative effect on the game or the vision for the game? Ooh, that is a big, scary question. Um, <laughs> you know, um, a lot of it is just experience, knowing your audience, knowing your game. Uh, it can take a lot of forethought, especially when it comes to things like your economy, really understanding and anticipating how that release is going to affect it. Um, I don't really have a more in-depth answer for you than that. Uh, it, it can be a very tricky thing, that's true. And the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. Okay. Uh, and our next one, should content cadence come before or after a major update? Um, you know, the answer is both. <laughs> um, you know, you can draw from your existing systems for an update that comes before your major update. Um, and then after the major update comes out, that's when you start leaning on any systems that you introduced in that release to maybe try out some different content cadence content. Um, so, you know, you always want to be doing both. It really just depends on you know, which release you start with. All right. And our last question, at least for now, oh no, another one popped up, but someone is having content treadmill woes, Aaron. So they ask, what do I do when my players are consuming my content cadence updates quicker than I can reasonably produce them? Yeah. Then, you know, it's time to start thinking about how you can put some roadblocks in place, make them work a little harder to unlock that content. So, you know, if you don't have player levels in your game, maybe that's a good excuse to add them so that, you know, you have to reach level 10 before you can even access that content. Um, you can also start charging more, things like that. So anything that will slow it down, you know, if you increase a soft currency price, then you're not preventing players from getting that content. They just have to work a little harder to earn enough currency to get it. So there are some things that you can do um, to pace that content out more and require more effort and progress from your players. All right. Well, last call for questions. And if not, I believe that's all we have. All right. Well, Aaron, thank you very much for presenting today. And a big shout out to Missimo and Dinosmore as well for helping us produce this. And a thanks for all of you for coming and asking all of these really awesome questions today.